The City of God, Book One, Preface, and Chapters One through Fifteen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darren L. Slider, www.logoslibrary.org. The City of God by St. Augustine of Hippo. Book One. Preface. The glorious city of God is my theme in this work, which you, my dearest son Marcellinus, suggested, and which is due to you by my promise. I have undertaken its defence against those who prefer their own gods to the founder of this city, a city surpassingly glorious, whether we view it as it still lives by faith in this fleeting course of time, and sojourns as a stranger in the midst of the ungodly, or as it shall dwell in the fixed stability of its eternal seat, which it now with patience waits for, expecting until righteousness shall return unto judgment, and it obtain, by virtue of its excellence, final victory and perfect peace. A great work this, and an arduous, but God is my helper." for I am aware what ability is requisite to persuade the proud how great is the virtue of humility, which raises us, not by a quite human arrogance, but by a divine grace, above all earthly dignities that totter on this shifting scene. For the king and founder of this city of which we speak has in scripture uttered to his people a dictum of the divine law in these words, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. But this, which is God's prerogative, the inflated ambition of a proud spirit also affects, and dearly loves that this be numbered among its attributes, to show pity to the humbled soul, and crush the sons of pride. And therefore, as the plan of this work we have undertaken requires, and as occasion offers, we must speak also of the earthly city, which, though it be mistress of the nations, is itself ruled by its lust of rule. CHAPTER One. For to this earthly city belong the enemies against whom I have to defend the city of God. Many of them, indeed, being reclaimed from their ungodly error, have become sufficiently creditable citizens of this city. But many are so inflamed with hatred against it, and are so ungrateful to its Redeemer for his signal benefits, as to forget that they would now be unable to utter a single word to its prejudice, had they not found in its sacred places, as they fled from the enemy's steel, that life in which they now boast themselves. Are not those very Romans who were spared by the barbarians through their respect for Christ, become enemies to the name of Christ? The reliquaries of the martyrs and the churches of the apostles bear witness to this, for in the sack of the city they were open sanctuary for all who fled to them, whether Christian or pagan. To their very threshold the bloodthirsty enemy raged, there his murderous fury owned a limit. Thither did such of the enemy as had any pity convey those to whom they had given quarter, lest any less mercifully disposed might fall upon them. And, indeed, when even those murderers who everywhere else showed themselves pitiless, came to those spots where that was forbidden which the license of war permitted in every other place, their furious rage for slaughter was bridled, and their eagerness to take prisoners was quenched. Thus escaped multitudes who now reproach the Christian religion, and impute to Christ the ills that have befallen their city. But the preservation of their own life, a boon which they owe to the respect entertained for Christ by the barbarians, they attribute not to our Christ, but to their own good luck. They ought rather, had they any right perceptions, to attribute the severities and hardships inflicted by their enemies, to that divine providence which is wont to reform the depraved manners of men by chastisement, and which exercises with similar afflictions the righteous and praiseworthy, either translating them, when they have passed through the trial, to a better world, or detaining them still on earth for ulterior purposes and they ought to attribute it to the spirit of these Christian times, that contrary to the custom of war, these bloodthirsty barbarians spared them, and spared them for Christ's sake, whether this mercy was actually shown in promiscuous places, or in those places specially dedicated to Christ's name, and of which the very largest were selected as sanctuaries, that full scope might thus be given to the expansive compassion which desired that a large multitude might find shelter there. Therefore they ought to give God thanks, and with sincere confession flee for refuge to his name, that so they may escape the punishment of eternal fire. They who with lying lips took upon them this name, that they might escape the punishment of present destruction. 
for of those whom you see insolently and shamelessly insulting the servants of Christ, there are numbers who would not have escaped that destruction and slaughter, had they not pretended that they themselves were Christ's servants. Yet now, an ungrateful pride and most impious madness, and at the risk of being punished in everlasting darkness, they perversely oppose that name, under which they fraudulently protected themselves for the sake of enjoying the light of this brief life. CHAPTER Two. There are histories of numberless wars, both before the building of Rome, and since its rise, and the extension of its dominion. Let these be read, and let one instance be cited in which, when a city had been taken by foreigners, the victors spared those who were found who have fled for sanctuary to the temples of their gods. Or one instance in which a barbarian general gave orders that none should be put to the sword who had been found in this or that temple. Did not Aeneas see, dying Priam at the shrine, staining the hearth he made divine? Did not Diomede and Ulysses drag with red hands the sentry slain, her fateful image from your fane, her chaste locks touch, and stain with gore the virgin coronal she wore? Neither is that true which follows, that thenceforth the tide of fortune changed, and Greece grew weak. For after this they conquered and destroyed Troy with fire and sword, after this they beheaded Priam as he fled to the altars. Neither did Troy perish because it lost Minerva. For what had Minerva herself first lost, that she should perish? Her guards, perhaps? No doubt, just her guards. For as soon as they were slain, she could be stolen. It was not, in fact, the men who were preserved by the image, but the image by the men. How, then, was she invoked to defend the city and the citizens, she who could not defend her own defenders? CHAPTER Three. And these be the gods to whose protecting care the Romans were delighted to entrust their city. Oh, too, too piteous mistake! And they are enraged at us when we speak thus about their gods, though, so far from being enraged at their own writers, they part with money to learn what they say. And, indeed, the very teachers of these authors are reckoned worthy of a salary from the public purse, and of other honours. There is Virgil, who is read by boys, in order that this great poet, this most famous and approved of all poets, may impregnate their virgin minds, and may not readily be forgotten by them, according to that saying of Horace, The fresh cask long keeps its first tang. Well, in this Virgil, I say, Juno is introduced as hostile to the Trojans, and stirring up Aeolus, the king of the winds, against them in the words, A race I hate now ploughs the sea, transporting Troy to Italy, and home gods conquered. And ought prudent men to have entrusted the defence of Rome to these conquered gods? But, it will be said, this was only the saying of Juno, who, like an angry woman, did not know what she was saying. What then says Aeneas himself? Aeneas, who was so often designated pious, does he not say, Lo, Panthus, scaped from death by flight, priest of Apollo on the height, his conquered gods with trembling hands he bears, and shelter swift demands? Is it not clear that the gods, whom he does not scruple to call conquered, were rather entrusted to Aeneas than he to them, when it is said to him, The gods of her domestic shrines your country to your care consigns? If, then, Virgil says that the gods were such as these, and were conquered, and that when conquered they could not escape except under the protection of a man, what a madness is it to suppose that Rome had been wisely entrusted to these guardians, and could not have been taken unless it had lost them? Indeed, to worship conquered gods as protectors and champions, what is this but to worship not good divinities, but evil omens? Would it not be wiser to believe, not that Rome would never have fallen into so great a calamity, had they not first perished, but rather that they would have perished long since had not Rome preserved them as long as she could? For who does not see, when he thinks of it, what a foolish assumption it is that they could not be vanquished under vanquished defenders, and that they only perished because they had lost their guardian gods, when indeed the only cause of their perishing was that they chose for their protectors gods condemned to perish? The poets, therefore, when they composed and sang these things about the conquered gods, had no intention to invent falsehoods, but uttered, as honest men, what the truth extorted from them. This, however, will be carefully and copiously discussed in another and more fitting place. 
Meanwhile, I will briefly, and to the best of my ability, explain what I meant to say about these ungrateful men who blasphemously impute to Christ the calamities which they deservedly suffer in consequence of their own wicked ways, while that which is for Christ's sake spared them in spite of their wickedness they do not even take the trouble to notice, and in their mad and blasphemous insolence they use against his name those very lips wherewith they falsely claimed that same name that their lives might be spared." In the places consecrated to Christ, where for his sake no enemy would injure them, they restrain their tongues that they might be safe and protected, but no sooner do they emerge from these sanctuaries than they unbridle these tongues to hurl against him curses full of hate. CHAPTER four. Troy itself, the mother of the Roman people, was not able, as I have said, to protect its own citizens in the sacred places of their gods from the fire and sword of the Greeks though the Greeks worship the same gods. Not only so, but, Phoenix and Ulysses fell, and the void courts by Juno's cell were set the spoils to keep. Snatched from the burning shrines away, there Ilium's mighty treasure lay, rich altars, bowls of massy gold, and captive raiment rudely rolled in one promiscuous heap, while boys and matrons, wild with fear, in long array were standing near. In other words, the place consecrated to so great a goddess was chosen, not that from it none might be led out a captive, but that in it all the captives might be immured. Compare now this asylum, the asylum not of an ordinary god, not of one of the rank and file of gods, but of Jove's own sister and wife, the queen of all the gods, with the churches built in memory of the apostles. Into it were collected the spoils rescued from the blazing temples and snatched from the gods, not that they might be restored to the vanquished, but divided among the victors. While into these were carried back, with the most religious observance and respect, everything which belonged to them, even though found elsewhere. There liberty was lost, here preserved. There bondage was strict, here strictly excluded." Into that temple men were driven to become the chattels of their enemies, now lording it over them. Into these churches men were led by their relenting foes, that they might be at liberty. In fine, the gentle Greeks appropriated that temple of Juno to the purposes of their own avarice and pride, while these churches of Christ were chosen even by the savage barbarians as the fit scenes for humility and mercy. But perhaps after all the Greeks did in that victory of theirs spare the temples of those gods whom they worshipped in common with the Trojans, and did not dare to put to the sword or make captive the wretched and vanquished Trojans who fled thither, and perhaps Virgil in the manner of poets has depicted what never really happened. But there is no question that he depicted the usual custom of an enemy when sacking a city. CHAPTER five. Even Caesar himself gives us positive testimony regarding this custom. For, in his deliverance in the Senate about the conspirators, he says, as Sallust, a historian of distinguished veracity, writes, that virgins and boys are violated, children torn from the embrace of their parents, matrons subjected to whatever should be the pleasure of the conquerors, temples and houses plundered, slaughtered, and burning rife, and fine all things filled with arms, corpses, blood, and wailing. If he had not mentioned temples here, we might suppose that enemies were in the habit of sparing the dwellings of the gods. And the Roman temples were in danger of these disasters not from foreign foes, but from Catalan and his associates, the most noble senators and citizens of Rome. But these, it may be said, were abandoned men and the parasites of their fatherland. CHAPTER six. Why then need our argument take note of the many nations who have waged wars with one another, and have nowhere spared the conquered in the temples of their gods? Let us look at the practice of the Romans themselves. Let us, I say, recall and review the Romans, whose chief praise it has been to spare the vanquished and subdue the proud, and that they preferred rather to forgive than to revenge an injury, and among so many and great cities which they have stormed, taken, and overthrown for the extension of their dominion, let us be told what temples they were accustomed to exempt, so that whoever took refuge in them was free. Or have they really done this, and has the fact been suppressed by the historians of these events? Is it to be believed that men who sought out with the greatest eagerness points they could praise, would omit those which, in their own estimation, are the most signal proofs of piety? Marcus Marcellus, a distinguished Roman who took Syracuse, a most splendidly adorned city, is reported to have bewailed its coming ruin, and to have shed his own tears over it before he spilt its blood. He took steps also to preserve the chastity even of his enemy. 
for before he gave orders for the storming of the city, he issued an edict forbidding the violation of any free person. Yet the city was sacked according to the custom of war, nor do we anywhere read that even by so chaste and gentle a commander orders were given that no one should be injured who had fled to this or that temple. And this certainly would by no means have been omitted, when neither his weeping nor his edict preservative of chastity could be passed in silence. Fabius, the conqueror of the city of Tarentum, is praised for abstaining from making booty of the images. For when his secretary proposed the question to him, what he wished done with the statues of the gods, which had been taken in large numbers, he veiled his moderation under a joke. For he asked of what sort they were, and when they reported to him that there were not only many large images, but some of them armed, Oh, says he, let us leave with the Tarentines their angry gods. Seeing then that the writers of Roman history could not pass in silence, neither the weeping of the one general nor the laughing of the other, neither the chaste pity of the one nor the facetious moderation of the other, on what occasion would it be omitted if, for the honour of any of their enemies' gods, they had shown this particular form of leniency, that in any temple slaughter or captivity was prohibited? CHAPTER Seven. All the spoiling, then, which Rome was exposed to in the recent calamity, all the slaughter, plundering, burning, and misery, was the result of the custom of war. But what was novel was that savage barbarians showed themselves in so gentle a guise, that the largest churches were chosen and set apart for the purpose of being filled with the people to whom quarter was given, and that in them none were slain, from them none forcibly dragged, that into them many were led by their relenting enemies to be set at liberty, and that from them none were led into slavery by merciless foes. Whoever does not see that this is to be attributed to the name of Christ, and to the Christian temper, is blind. Whoever sees this, and gives no praise, is ungrateful. Whoever hinders any one from praising it, is mad. Far be it from any prudent man to impute this clemency to the barbarians. Their fierce and bloody minds were awed, and bridled, and marvellously tempered, by him who so long before said by his prophet, I will visit their transgression with a rod, and their iniquities with stripes. Nevertheless my loving-kindness will I not utterly take from them. CHAPTER Eight. Will some one say, Why then was this divine compassion extended even to the ungodly and ungrateful? Why, but because it was the mercy of him who daily maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust? For though some of these men, taking thought of this, repent of their wickedness and reform, some, as the apostle says, despising the richness of his goodness and long-suffering, after their hardness and impenitent heart, treasure up unto themselves wrath against the day of wrath, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. Nevertheless does the patience of God still invite the wicked to repentance, even as the scourge of God educates the good to patience. And so, too, does the mercy of God embrace the good that it may cherish them, as the severity of God arrests the wicked to punish them. To the divine providence it has seemed good to prepare in the world to come, for the righteous, good things, which the unrighteous shall not enjoy, and for the wicked, evil things, by which the good shall not be tormented. But as for the good things of this life, and its ills, God has willed that these should be common to both, that we might not too eagerly covet the things which wicked men are seen equally to enjoy, nor shrink with an unseemly fear from the ills which even good men often suffer. There is, too, a very great difference in the purpose served both by those events which we call adverse, and those called prosperous. For the good man is neither uplifted with the good things of time, nor broken by its ills, but the wicked man, because he is corrupted by this world's happiness, feels himself punished by its unhappiness. Yet often, even in the present distribution of temporal things, does God plainly evince his own interference. For if every sin were now visited with manifest punishment, nothing would seem to be reserved for the final judgment. On the other hand, if no sin received now a plainly divine punishment, it would be concluded that there is no divine providence at all. And so of the good things of this life, if God did not by a very visible liberality confer these on some of those persons who ask for them, we should say that these good things were not at his disposal, and if he gave them to all who sought them, we should suppose that such were the only rewards of his service, and such a service would make us not godly, but greedy rather, and covetous. Wherefore, though good and bad men suffer alike, we must not suppose that there is no difference between the men themselves, because there is no difference in what they both suffer. 
For even in the likeness of the sufferings there remains an unlikeness in the sufferers. And though exposed to the same anguish, virtue and vice are not the same thing. For as the same fire causes gold to glow brightly, and chaff to smoke, and under the same flail the straw is beaten small while the grain is cleansed, and as the lees are not mixed with the oil, though squeezed out of the vat by the same pressure, so the same violence of affliction proves, purges, clarifies the good, but damns, ruins, exterminates the wicked. And thus it is that in the same affliction the wicked detest God and blaspheme, while the good pray and praise. So material a difference does it make, not what ills are suffered, but what kind of man suffers them. For, stirred up with the same movement, mud exhales a horrible stench, and ointment emits a fragrant odor. CHAPTER Nine. What, then, have the Christians suffered in that calamitous period which would not profit every one who duly and faithfully considered the following circumstances? First of all, they must humbly consider those very sins which have provoked God to fill the world with such terrible disasters. For although they be far from the excesses of wicked, immoral, and ungodly men, yet they do not judge themselves so clean removed from all faults as to be too good to suffer for these even temporal ills. For every man, however laudably he lives, yet yields in some points to the lust of the flesh. Though he do not fall into gross enormity of wickedness, and abandon viciousness, and abominable profanity, yet he slips into some sins, either rarely, or so much the more frequently as the sins seem of less account. But not to mention this, where can we readily find a man who holds in fit and just estimation those persons on account of whose revolting pride, luxury, and avarice, and cursed iniquities and impiety, God now smites the earth as his predictions threatened? Where is the man who lives with them in the style in which it becomes us to live with them? For often we wickedly blind ourselves to the occasions of teaching and admonishing them, sometimes even of reprimanding and chiding them, either because we shrink from the labor, or are ashamed to offend them, or because we fear to lose good friendships, lest this should stand in the way of our advancement, or injure us in some worldly matter, which either our covetous disposition desires to obtain, or our weakness shrinks from losing." so that, although the conduct of wicked men is distasteful to the good, and therefore they do not fall with them into that damnation which in the next life awaits such persons, yet, because they spare their damnable sins through fear, therefore, even though their own sins be slight and venial, they are justly scourged with the wicked in this world, though in eternity they quite escape punishment. Justly, when God afflicts them in common with the wicked, do they find this life bitter, through love of whose sweetness they decline to be bitter to these sinners. If any one forbears to reprove and find fault with those who are doing wrong, because he seeks a more seasonable opportunity, or because he fears they may be made worse by his rebuke, or that other weak persons might be disheartened from endeavouring to lead a good and pious life, and may be driven from the faith, this man's omission seems to be occasioned not by covetousness, but by a charitable consideration. But what is blameworthy is, that they who themselves revolt from the conduct of the wicked, and live in quite another fashion, yet spare those faults in other men which they ought to reprehend and wean them from, and spare them because they fear to give offence, lest they should injure their interests in those things which good men may innocently and legitimately use, though they use them more greedily than becomes persons who are strangers in this world, and profess the hope of a heavenly country. For not only the weaker brethren who enjoy married life, and have children, or desire to have them, and own houses and establishments, whom the apostle addresses in the churches, warning and instructing them how they should live, both the wives with their husbands, and the husbands with their wives, the children with their parents, and parents with their children, and servants with their masters, and masters with their servants, not only do these weaker brethren gladly obtain and grudgingly lose many earthly and temporal things, on account of which they dare not offend men whose polluted and wicked life greatly displeases them, but those also who live at a higher level, who are not entangled in the meshes of married life, but use meagre food and raiment, do often take thought of their own safety and good name, and abstain from finding fault with the wicked, because they fear their wiles and violence. And although they do not fear them to such an extent as to be drawn to the commission of like iniquities, nay, not by any threats or violence soever, yet those very deeds which they refuse to share in the commission of, they often decline to find fault with, when possibly they might by finding fault prevent their commission. 
they abstain from interference because they fear that if it fail of good effect their own safety or reputation may be damaged or destroyed, not because they see that their preservation and good name are needful, that they may be able to influence those who need their instruction, but rather because they weakly relish the flattery and respect of men, and fear the judgments of the people, and the pain or death of the body." that is to say, their non-intervention is the result of selfishness, and not of love. Accordingly, this seems to me to be one principal reason why the good are chastised along with the wicked, when God is pleased to visit with temporal punishments the profligate manners of a community. They are punished together not because they have spent an equally corrupt life, but because the good as well as the wicked, though not equally with them, love this present life while they ought to hold it cheap, that the wicked, being admonished and reformed by their example, might lay hold of life eternal. And if they will not be the companions of the good in seeking life everlasting, they should be loved as enemies, and dealt with patiently. For so long as they live it remains uncertain whether they may not come to a better mind. These selfish persons have more cause to fear than those to whom it was said through the prophet, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. For watchmen or overseers of the people are appointed in churches, that they may unsparingly rebuke sin. Nor is that man guiltless of the sin we speak of, who, though he be not a watchman, yet sees in the conduct of those with whom the relationships of this life bring him into contact many things that should be blamed, and yet overlooks them, fearing to give offence, and lose such worldly blessings as may legitimately be desired, but which he too eagerly grasps. Then, lastly, there is another reason why the good are afflicted with temporal calamities, the reason which Job's case exemplifies, that the human spirit may be proved, and that it may be manifested with what fortitude of pious trust, and with how unmercenary a love it cleaves to God. CHAPTER Ten. These are the considerations which one must keep in view, that he may answer the question whether any evil happens to the faithful and godly which cannot be turned to profit. Or shall we say that the question is needless, and that the apostle is vaporing when he says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God? They lost all they had, their faith, their godliness, the possessions of the hidden man of the heart, which in the sight of God are of great price. Did they lose these? For these are the wealth of Christians, to whom the wealthy apostle said, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows." They then who lost their worldly all in the sack of Rome, if they owned their possessions, as they had been taught by the apostle, who himself was poor without, but rich within, that is to say, if they used the world as not using it, could say in the words of Job, heavily tried but not overcome, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. As it pleased the Lord, so has it come to pass. Blessed be the name of the Lord." Like a good servant, Job counted the will of his Lord his great possession, by obedience to which his soul was enriched. Nor did it grieve him to lose, while yet living, those goods which he must shortly leave at his death. But as to those feebler spirits, who, though they cannot be said to prefer earthly possessions to Christ, do yet cleave to them with a somewhat immoderate attachment, they have discovered by the pain of losing these things how much they were sinning in loving them. For their grief is of their own making. In the words of the Apostle quoted above, they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. For it was well that they who had so long despised these verbal admonitions should receive the teaching of experience. For when the Apostle says, They that will be rich fall into temptation, and so on, what he blames in riches is not the possession of them, but the desire of them. For elsewhere, he says, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. 
They who are making such a use of their property have been consoled for light losses by great gains, and have had more pleasure in those possessions which they have securely laid past by freely giving them away, than grief in those which they entirely lost by an anxious and selfish hoarding of them. For nothing could perish on earth save what they would be ashamed to carry away from earth. Our Lord's injunction runs, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And they who have listened to this injunction have proved in the time of tribulation how well they were advised in not despising this most trustworthy teacher, and most faithful and mighty guardian of their treasure. For if many were glad that their treasure was stored in places which the enemy chanced not to light upon, how much better founded was the joy of those who, by the counsel of their God, had fled with their treasure to a citadel which no enemy can possibly reach. Thus our Paulinus, bishop of Nola, who voluntarily abandoned vast wealth and became quite poor, though abundantly rich in holiness, when the barbarians sacked Nola, and took him prisoner, used silently to pray, as he afterwards told me, O Lord, let me not be troubled for gold and silver, for where all my treasure is, thou knowest. For all his treasure was where he had been taught to hide and store it, by him who had also foretold that these calamities would happen in the world. Consequently, those persons who obeyed their Lord, when he warned them, where and how to lay up treasure, did not lose even their earthly possessions in the invasion of the barbarians, while those who are now repenting that they did not obey him, have learnt the right use of earthly goods, if not by the wisdom which would have prevented their loss, at least by the experience which follows it. But some good and Christian men have been put to the torture, that they might be forced to deliver up their goods to the enemy. They could indeed neither deliver nor lose that good which made themselves good. If, however, they preferred torture to the surrender of the mammon of iniquity, then I say they were not good men. Rather they should have been reminded that, if they suffered so severely for the sake of money, they should endure all torment, if need be, for Christ's sake, that they might be taught to love him rather who enriches with eternal felicity all who suffer for him, and not silver and gold, for which it was pitiable to suffer, whether they preserved it by telling a lie, or lost it by telling the truth. For under these tortures no one lost Christ by confessing him, no one preserved wealth save by denying its existence so that possibly the torture which taught them that they should set their affections on a possession they could not lose, was more useful than those possessions which, without any useful fruit at all, disquieted and tormented their anxious owners. But then we are reminded that some were tortured who had no wealth to surrender, but who were not believed when they said so. These too, however, had perhaps some craving for wealth, and were not willingly poor with a holy resignation and to such it had to be made plain, that not the actual possession alone, but also the desire of wealth, deserved such excruciating pains. And even if they were destitute of any hidden stores of gold and silver, because they were living in hopes of a better life, I know not indeed if any such person was tortured on the supposition that he had wealth. But if so, then certainly in confessing, when put to the question, a holy poverty, he confessed Christ. And though it was scarcely to be expected that the barbarians should believe him, yet no confessor of a holy poverty could be tortured without receiving a heavenly reward. Again, they say that the long famine laid many a Christian low. But this too the faithful turned to good uses by a pious endurance of it. For those whom famine killed outright, it rescued from the ills of this life, as a kindly disease would have done, and those who were only hunger-bitten were taught to live more sparingly, and inured to longer fasts. CHAPTER Eleven. But, it is added, many Christians were slaughtered, and were put to death in a hideous variety of cruel ways. Well, if this be hard to bear, it is assuredly the common lot of all who were born into this life. Of this at least I am certain, that no one has ever died who was not destined to die some time. Now the end of life puts the longest life on a par with the shortest. For of two things which have alike ceased to be, the one is not better, the other worse, the one greater, the other less. And of what consequence is it what kind of death puts an end to life, since he who has died once is not forced to go through the same ordeal a second time? And, as in the daily casualties of life every man is, as it were, threatened with numberless deaths, so long as it remains uncertain which of them is his fate, I would ask whether it is not better to suffer one and die, than to live in fear of all. 
I am not unaware of the poor-spirited fear which prompts us to choose rather to live long in fear of so many deaths, than to die once and so escape them all. But the weak and cowardly shrinking of the flesh is one thing, and the well-considered and reasonable persuasion of the soul quite another. That death is not to be judged an evil which is the end of a good life. For death becomes evil only by the retribution which follows it. They, then, who are destined to die, need not be careful to inquire what death they are to die, but into what place death will usher them. And since Christians are well aware that the death of the godly pauper whose sores the dogs licked was far better than of the wicked rich man who lay in purple and fine linen, what harm could these terrific deaths do to the dead who had lived well? CHAPTER Twelve. Further still, we are reminded that in such a carnage as then occurred, the bodies could not even be buried. But godly confidence is not appalled by so ill-omened a circumstance, for the faithful bear in mind that assurance has been given that not a hair of their head shall perish, and that therefore, though they be even devoured by beasts, their blessed resurrection will not hereby be hindered. The truth would nowise have said, Fear not them which killed the body, but are not able to kill the soul, if anything whatever that an enemy could do to the body of the slain could be detrimental to the future life. Or will someone perhaps take so absurd a position as to contend that those who kill the body are not to be feared before death, unless they kill the body, but after death, lest they deprive it of burial? If this be so, then that is false which Christ says, Be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. For it seems they can do great injury to the dead body. Far be it from us to suppose that the truth can be thus false. They who kill the body are said to do something, because the death-blow is felt, the body still having sensation, but after that they have no more that they can do, for in the slain body there is no sensation. And so there are indeed many bodies of Christians lying unburied, but no one has separated them from heaven, nor from that earth which is all filled with the presence of him who knows whence he will raise again what he created. It is said indeed in the psalm, the dead bodies of thy servants have they given to be meat unto the fowls of the heaven, the flesh of thy saints unto the beasts of the earth. Their blood have they shed like water round about Jerusalem, and there was none to bury them. But this was said rather to exhibit the cruelty of those who did these things, than the misery of those who suffered them. To the eyes of men this appears a harsh and doleful lot, yet precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Wherefore all these at last offences and ceremonies that concern the dead, the careful funeral arrangements, and the equipment of the tomb, and the pomp of obsequies, are rather the solace of the living than the comfort of the dead. If a costly burial does any good to a wicked man, a squalid burial, or none at all, may harm the godly. His crowd of domestics furnish the purple-clad dives with a funeral gorgeous in the eye of man, but in the sight of God that was a more sumptuous funeral which the ulcerous pauper received at the hands of the angels, who did not carry him out to a marble tomb, but bore him aloft to Abraham's bosom. The men against whom I have undertaken to defend the city of God laugh at all this, but even their own philosophers have despised a careful burial and often whole armies have fought and fallen for their earthly country without caring to inquire whether they would be left exposed in the field of battle or become the food of wild beasts of this noble disregard of sepulture poetry has well said he who has no tomb has the sky for his vault how much less ought they to insult over the unburied bodies of christians to whom it has been promised that the flesh itself shall be restored and the body formed anew all the members of it being gathered not only from the earth but from the most secret recesses of any other of the elements in which the dead bodies of men have lain hid chapter thirteen nevertheless the bodies of the dead are not on this account to be despised and left unburied least of all the bodies of the righteous and faithful which have been used by the holy spirit as his organs and instruments for all good works for if the dress of a father or his ring or anything he wore be precious to his children in proportion to the love they bore him with how much more reason ought we to care for the bodies of those we love which they wore far more closely and intimately than any clothing for the body is not an extraneous ornament or aid, but a part of man's very nature. And therefore to the righteous of ancient times the last offices were piously rendered, and sepulchres provided for them, and obsequies celebrated. And they themselves, while yet alive, gave commandment to their sons about the burial, and, on occasion, even about the removal of their bodies to some favourite place. 
and Tobit, according to the angel's testimony, is commended, and is said to have pleased God by burying the dead. Our Lord himself, too, though he was to rise again the third day, applauds and commends to our applause the good work of the religious woman who poured precious ointment over his limbs, and did it against his burial. And the gospel speaks with commendation of those who were careful to take down his body from the cross, and wrap it lovingly in costly cerements, and see to its burial. These instances certainly do not prove that corpses have any feeling, but they show that God's providence extends even to the bodies of the dead, and that such pious offices are pleasing to him as cherishing faith in the resurrection. And we may also draw from them this wholesome lesson, that if God does not forget even any kind office which loving care pays to the unconscious dead, much more does he reward the charity we exercise towards the living. Other things, indeed, which the holy patriarchs said of the burial and removal of their bodies, they meant to be taken in a prophetic sense, but of these we need not here speak at large, what we have already said being sufficient. But if the want and support of the living, as food and clothing, though painful and trying, does not break down the fortitude and virtuous endurance of good men, nor eradicate piety from their souls, but rather renders it more fruitful, how much less can the absence of the funeral, and of the other customary attentions paid to the dead, render those wretched who are already reposing in the hidden abodes of the blessed? Consequently, though in the sack of Rome and of other towns the dead bodies of the Christians were deprived of these last offices, this is not of the fault of the living, for they could not render them, nor an infliction to the dead, for they cannot feel the loss. CHAPTER fourteen. But, say they, many Christians were even led away captive. This indeed were a most pitiable fate, if they could be led away to any place where they could not find their God. But for this calamity also sacred scripture affords great consolation. The three youths were captives, Daniel was a captive, so were other prophets, and God the Comforter did not fail them. And in like manner he has not failed his own people in the power of a nation which, though barbarous, is yet human, he who did not abandon the prophet in the belly of a monster. These things indeed are turned to ridicule rather than credited by those with whom we are debating, though they believe what they read in their own books, that Arion of Methymna, the famous lyrist, when he was thrown overboard, was received on a dolphin's back and carried to land. But that story of ours about the prophet Jonah is far more incredible, more incredible because more marvellous, and more marvellous because a greater exhibition of power. CHAPTER fifteen. But among their own famous men they have a very noble example of the voluntary endurance of captivity in obedience to a religious scruple. Marcus Atilius Regulus, a Roman general, was a prisoner in the hands of the Carthaginians. But they, being more anxious to exchange their prisoners with the Romans than to keep them, sent Regulus as a special envoy with their own ambassadors to negotiate this exchange, but bound him first with an oath that if he failed to accomplish their wish, he would return to Carthage. He went and persuaded the Senate to the opposite course, because he believed it was not for the advantage of the Roman Republic to make an exchange of prisoners. After he had thus exerted his influence, the Romans did not compel him to return to the enemy, but what he had sworn he voluntarily performed. But the Carthaginians put him to death with refined, elaborate, and horrible tortures. They shut him up in a narrow box in which he was compelled to stand, and in which finely sharpened nails were fixed all round about him, so that he could not lean upon any part of it without intense pain, and so they killed him by depriving him of sleep. With justice, indeed, do they applaud the virtue which rose superior to so frightful a fate. However, the gods he swore by were those who were now supposed to avenge the prohibition of their worship by inflicting these present calamities on the human race. But if these gods who were worshipped specially in this behalf, that they might confer happiness in this life, either willed or permitted these punishments to be inflicted on one who kept his oath to them, what more cruel punishment could they in their anger have inflicted on a perjured person? But why may I not draw from my reasoning a double inference? Regulus certainly had such reverence for the gods that for his oath's sake he would neither remain in his own land nor go elsewhere, but without hesitation return to his bitterest enemies. If he thought that this course would be advantageous with respect to this present life, he was certainly much deceived, for it brought his life to a frightful termination. 
By his own example, in fact, he taught that the gods do not secure the temporal happiness of their worshippers, since he himself, who was devoted to their worship, as both conquered in battle and taken prisoner, and then because he refused to act in violation of the oath he had sworn by them, was tortured and put to death by a new and hitherto unheard of, and all too horrible kind of punishment. And on the supposition that the worshippers of the gods are rewarded by felicity in the life to come, why, then, do they calumniate the influence of Christianity? Why do they assert that this disaster has overtaken the city because it has ceased to worship its gods, since, worship them as assiduously as it may, it may yet be as unfortunate as Regulus was? Or will someone carry so wonderful a blindness to the extent of wildly attempting, in the face of the evident truth, to contend that though one man might be unfortunate, though a worshipper of the gods, yet a whole city could not be so? That is to say, the power of their gods is better adapted to preserve multitudes than individuals, as if a multitude were not composed of individuals. But if they say that Marcus Regulus, even while a prisoner and enduring these bodily torments, might yet enjoy the blessedness of a virtuous soul, then let them recognize the true virtue by which a city also may be blessed. For the blessedness of a community and of an individual flow from the same source, for a community is nothing else than a harmonious collection of individuals, so that I am not concerned meantime to discuss what kind of virtue Regulus possessed, enough that by his very noble example they are forced to own that the gods are to be worshipped not for the sake of bodily comforts or external advantages, for he preferred to lose all such things rather than offend the gods by whom he had sworn. But what can we make of men who glory in having such a citizen, but dread having a city like him? If they do not dread this, then let them acknowledge that some such calamity as befell Regulus may also befall a community, though they be worshipping their gods as diligently as he, and let them no longer throw the blame of their misfortunes on Christianity. But as our present concern is with those Christians who were taken prisoners, let those who take occasion from this calamity to revile our most wholesome religion in a fashion not less imprudent than impudent, consider this and hold their peace. For if it was no reproach to their gods that a most punctilious worshipper of theirs should, for the sake of keeping his oath to them, be deprived of his native land without hope of finding another, and fall into the hands of his enemies, and be put to death by a long-drawn and exquisite torture, much less ought the Christian name to be charged with the captivity of those who believe in its power, since they, in confident expectation of a heavenly country, know that they are pilgrims even in their own homes. End of Book One, Preface, and Chapters One through Fifteen. Recording by Darren L. Slider, www.logoslibrary.org. Book One, Chapters Sixteen through Thirty Six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darren L. Slider www.logoslibrary.org The City of God by St. Augustine of Hippo Book One, Chapter Sixteen But they fancy they bring a conclusive charge against Christianity when they aggravate the horror of captivity by adding that not only wives and unmarried maidens, but even consecrated virgins were violated. But truly, with respect to this, it is not Christian faith, nor piety, nor even the virtue of chastity which is hemmed into any difficulty. The only difficulty is so to treat the subject, as to satisfy at once modesty and reason. And in discussing it we shall not be so careful to reply to our accusers, as to comfort our friends. Let this, therefore, in the first place, be laid down as an unassailable position, that the virtue which makes the life good has its throne in the soul, and thence rules the members of the body, which becomes holy in virtue of the holiness of the will, and that while the will remains firm and unshaken, nothing that another person does with the body, or upon the body, is any fault of the person who suffers it, so long as he cannot escape it without sin. But as not only pain may be inflicted, but lust gratified on the body of another, whenever anything of this latter kind takes place, shame invades even a thoroughly pure spirit, from which modesty has not departed. Shame, lest that act which could not be suffered without some sensual pleasure, should be believed to have been committed also, with some assent of the will. CHAPTER Seventeen. 
and consequently, even if some of those virgins killed themselves to avoid such disgrace, who that has any human feeling would refuse to forgive them? And as for those who would not put an end to their lives, lest they might seem to escape the crime of another by a sin of their own, he who lays this to their charge as a great wickedness is himself not guiltless of the fault of folly. For if it is not lawful to take the law into our own hands, and slay even a guilty person whose death no public sentence is warranted, then certainly he who kills himself is a homicide, and so much the guiltier of his own death, as he was more innocent of that offence for which he doomed himself to die. Do we justly execrate the deed of Judas, and does truth itself pronounce that by hanging himself he rather aggravated than expiated the guilt of that most iniquitous betrayal, since by despairing of God's mercy in his sorrow that wrought death he left to himself no place for a healing penitence? How much more ought he to abstain from laying violent hands on himself who has done nothing worthy of such a punishment? For Judas, when he killed himself, killed a wicked man, but he passed from this life chargeable not only with the death of Christ, but with his own. For though he killed himself on account of his crime, his killing himself was another crime. Why then should a man who has done no ill do ill to himself, and by killing himself kill the innocent to escape another's guilty act, and perpetrate upon himself a sin of his own, that the sin of another may not be perpetrated on him? Chapter 18. But is there a fear that even another's lust may pollute the violated? It will not pollute if it be another's. If it pollute, it is not another's, but is shared also by the polluted. But since purity is a virtue of the soul, and has for its companion virtue, the fortitude which will rather endure all ills than consent to evil, and since no one, however magnanimous and pure, has always the disposal of his own body, but can control only the consent and refusal of his will, what sane man can suppose that, if his body be seized and forcibly made use of to satisfy the lust of another, he thereby loses his purity? For if purity can be thus destroyed, then assuredly purity is no virtue of the soul, nor can it be numbered among those good things by which the life is made good, but among the good things of the body, in the same category as strength, beauty, sound and unbroken health, and, in short, all such good things as may be diminished, without at all diminishing the goodness and rectitude of our life. But if purity be nothing better than these, why should the body be periled that it may be preserved? If, on the other hand, it belongs to the soul, then not even when the body is violated is it lost. Nay more, the virtue of holy continence, when it resists the uncleanness of carnal lust, sanctifies even the body, and therefore when this continence remains unsubdued, even the sanctity of the body is preserved, because the will to use it holily remains, and, so far as lies in the body itself, the power also. For the sanctity of the body does not consist in the integrity of its members, nor in their exemption from all touch, for they are exposed to various accidents which do violence to and wound them, and the surgeons who administer relief often perform operations that sicken the spectator. A midwife, suppose, has, whether maliciously or accidentally, or through unskilfulness, destroyed the virginity of some girl while endeavouring to ascertain it. I suppose no one is so foolish as to believe that by this destruction of the integrity of one organ the virgin has lost anything even of her bodily sanctity. And thus, so long as the soul keeps this firmness of purpose which sanctifies even the body, the violence done by another's lust makes no impression on this bodily sanctity which is preserved intact by one's own persistent continence. Suppose a virgin violates the oath she has sworn to God, and goes to meet her seducer with the intention of yielding to him, shall we say that as she goes she is possessed even of bodily sanctity, when already she has lost and destroyed that sanctity of soul which sanctifies the body? Far be it from us to so misapply words. Let us rather draw this conclusion, that while the sanctity of the soul remains even when the body is violated, the sanctity of the body is not lost and that, in like manner, the sanctity of the body is lost when the sanctity of the soul is violated, though the body itself remains intact. And therefore a woman who has been violated by the sin of another, and without any consent of her own, has no cause to put herself to death, much less has she cause to commit suicide in order to avoid such violation, for in that case she commits certain homicide to prevent a crime which is uncertain as yet, and not her own. CHAPTER Nineteen. 
This, then, is our position, and it seems sufficiently lucid. We maintain that when a woman is violated while her soul admits no consent to the iniquity, but remains inviolably chaste, the sin is not hers, but his who violates her. But do they against whom we have to defend not only the souls, but the sacred bodies, too, of these outraged Christian captives, do they perhaps dare to dispute our position? But all know how loudly they extol the purity of Lucretia, that noble matron of ancient Rome. When King Tarquin's son had violated her body, she made known the wickedness of this young profligate to her husband Colatinus, and to Brutus her kinsman, men of high rank and full of courage, and bound them by an oath to avenge it. Then, heart-sick, and unable to bear the shame, she put an end to her life. What shall we call her? An adulteress, or chaste? There is no question which she was. Not more happily than truly did a declaimer say of this sad occurrence, Here was a marvel. There were two, and only one committed adultery. Most forcibly and truly spoken. For this declaimer, seeing in the union of the two bodies the foul lust of the one, and the chaste will of the other, and giving heed not to the contact of the bodily members, but to the wide diversity of their souls, says, There were two, but the adultery was committed only by one. But how is it that she who was no partner to the crime bears the heavier punishment of the two? For the adulterer was only banished along with his father, she suffered the extreme penalty. If that was not impurity by which she was unwillingly ravished, then this is not justice by which she, being chaste, is punished. To you I appeal, ye laws and judges of Rome. Even after the perpetration of great enormities, you do not suffer the criminal to be slain untried. If, then, one were to bring to your bar this case, and were to prove to you that a woman not only untried, but chaste and innocent, had been killed, would you not visit the murderer with punishment proportionately severe? This crime was committed by Lucretia, that Lucretia so celebrated and lauded slew the innocent, chaste, outraged Lucretia. Pronounce sentence. But if you cannot, because there does not appear any one whom you can punish, why do you extol with such unmeasured laudation her who slew an innocent and chaste woman? Assuredly you will find it impossible to defend her before the judges of the realms below, if they be such as your poets are fond of representing them. For she is among those who guiltless sent themselves to doom, and all for loathing of the day, in madness threw their lives away. And if she with the others wishes to return, fate bars the way, around their keep the slow unlovely waters creep, and bind with ninefold chain. Or perhaps she is not there, because she slew herself conscious of guilt, not of innocence. She herself alone knows her reason. But what if she was betrayed by the pleasure of the act, and gave some consent to Sextus, though so violently abusing her, and then was so affected with remorse, that she thought death alone could expiate her sin? Even though this were the case, she ought still to have held her hand from suicide, if she could with her false gods have accomplished a fruitful repentance. However, if such were the state of the case, and if it were false that there were two, but only one committed adultery, if the truth were that both were involved in it, one by open assault, the other by secret consent, then she did not kill an innocent woman, and therefore her erudite defenders may maintain that she is not among that class of the dwellers below who guiltless sent themselves to doom. But this case of Lucretia is in such a dilemma, that if you extenuate the homicide, you confirm the adultery. If you acquit her of adultery, you make the charge of homicide heavier. And there is no way out of the dilemma when one asks, if she was adulterous, why praise her? If chaste, why slay her? Nevertheless, for our purpose of refuting those who are unable to comprehend what true sanctity is, and who therefore insult over our outraged Christian women, it is enough that in the instance of this noble Roman matron it was said in her praise, there were two, but the adultery was the crime of only one. For Lucretia was confidently believed to be superior to the contamination of any consenting thought to the adultery. And accordingly, since she killed herself for being subjected to an outrage in which she had no guilty part, it is obvious that this act of hers was prompted not by the love of purity, but by the overwhelming burden of her shame. She was ashamed that so foul a crime had been perpetrated upon her, though without her abetting, and this matron, with the Roman love of glory in her veins, was seized with a proud dread that if she continued to live it would be supposed she willingly did not resent the wrong that had been done her. 
she could not exhibit to men her conscience, but she judged that her self-inflicted punishment would testify her state of mind, and she burned with shame at the thought that her patient endurance of the foul affront that her another had done her should be construed into complicity with him. Not such was the decision of the Christian women who suffered as she did, and yet survive. They decline to avenge upon themselves the guilt of others, and so add crimes of their own to the, those crimes in which they had no share. For this they would have done had their shame driven them to homicide, as the lust of their enemies had driven them to adultery. Within their own souls, and the witness of their own conscience, they enjoy the glory of chastity. In the sight of God, too, they are esteemed pure, and this contents them. They ask no more. It suffices them to have opportunity of doing good, and they decline to evade the distress of human suspicion, lest they thereby deviate from the divine law. CHAPTER Twenty. It is not without significance that in no passage of the holy canonical books there can be found either divine precept or permission to take away our own life, whether for the sake of entering on the enjoyment of immortality, or of shunning or ridding ourselves of anything whatever. Nay, the law, rightly interpreted, even prohibits suicide, where it says, Thou shalt not kill. This is proved especially by the omission of the words thy neighbor, which are inserted when false witness is forbidden, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Nor yet should any one on this account suppose he has not broken this commandment, if he has borne false witness only against himself. For the love of our neighbor is regulated by the love of ourselves, as it is written, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. If, then, he who makes false statements about himself is not less guilty of bearing false witness than if he had made them to the injury of his neighbor, although in the commandment prohibiting false witness only his neighbor is mentioned, and persons taking no pains to understand it might suppose that a man was allowed to be a false witness to his own hurt, how much greater reason have we to understand that a man may not kill himself, since in the commandment thou shalt not kill there is no limitation added, nor any exception made in favor of any one and least of all in favor of him on whom the command is laid. And so some attempt to extend this command even to beasts and cattle, as if it forbade us to take life from any creature. But if so, why not extend it also to the plants, and all that is rooted in and nourished by the earth? For though this class of creatures have no sensation, yet they also are said to live, and consequently they can die, and therefore, if violence be done them, can be killed." So too the apostle, when speaking of the seeds of such things as these, says, That which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And in the psalm it is said, He killed their vines with hail. Must we therefore reckon it a breaking of this commandment, Thou shalt not kill, to pull a flower? Are we thus insanely to countenance the foolish error of the Manichaeans? Putting aside, then, these ravings, if, when we say, Thou shalt not kill, we do not understand this of the plants, since they have no sensation, nor of the irrational animals that fly, swim, walk, or creep, since they are dissociated from us by their want of reason, and are therefore by the just appointment of the Creator subjected to us, to kill or keep alive for our own uses. If so, then it remains that we understand that commandment simply of man. The commandment is, Thou shalt not kill man. Therefore neither another nor yourself, for he who kills himself still kills nothing else than man. CHAPTER Twenty One. However, there are some exceptions made by the divine authority to its own law, that men may not be put to death. These exceptions are of two kinds, being justified either by a general law, or by a special commission granted for a time to some individual. And in this latter case, he to whom authority is delegated, and who is but the sword in the hand of him who uses it, is not himself responsible for the death he deals. And accordingly they who have waged war in obedience to the divine command, or in conformity with his laws, have represented in their persons the public justice or the wisdom of government, and in this capacity have put to death wicked men. Such persons have by no means violated the commandment, Thou shalt not kill." Abraham, indeed, was not merely deemed guiltless of cruelty, but was even applauded for his piety, because he was ready to slay his son in obedience to God, not to his own passion. And it is reasonably enough made a question, whether we are to esteem it to have been in compliance with the command of God that Jephthah killed his daughter, because she met him when he had vowed that he would sacrifice to God whatever first met him as he returned victorious from battle. Samson, too, who drew down the house on himself and his foes together, is justified only on this ground, that the spirit who wrought wonders by him had given him secret instructions to do this. 
with the exception, then, of these two classes of cases, which are justified either by a just law that applies generally, or by a special intimation from God himself, the fountain of all justice, whoever kills a man, either himself or another, is implicated in the guilt of murder. CHAPTER Twenty Two. But they who have laid violent hands on themselves are perhaps to be admired for their greatness of soul, though they cannot be applauded for the soundness of their judgment. However, if you look at the matter more closely, you will scarcely call it greatness of soul, which prompts a man to kill himself, rather than bear up against some hardships of fortune, or sins in which he is not implicated. Is it not rather proof of a feeble mind to be unable to bear either the pains of bodily servitude, or the foolish opinion of the vulgar? And is not that to be pronounced the greater mind which rather faces than flees the ills of life, and which, in comparison of the light and purity of conscience, holds in small esteem the judgment of men, and specially of the vulgar, which is frequently involved in a mist of error? And, therefore, if suicide is to be esteemed a magnanimous act, none can take higher rank for magnanimity than that Cleombrotus, who, as the story goes, when he had read Plato's book in which he treats of the immortality of the soul, threw himself from a wall, and so passed from this life to that which he believed to be better. For he was not hard pressed by calamity, nor by any accusation, false or true, which he could not very well have lived down. There was, in short, no motive but only magnanimity urging him to seek death, and break away from the sweet detention of this life. And yet that this was a magnanimous rather than a justifiable action, Plato himself, whom he had read, would have told him, for he would certainly have been forward to commit, or at least to recommend, suicide, had not the same bright intellect which saw that the soul was immortal, discerned also that to seek immortality by suicide was to be prohibited rather than encouraged. Again, it is said that many have killed themselves to prevent an enemy doing so. But we are not inquiring whether it has been done, but whether it ought to have been done. Sound judgment is to be preferred even to examples, and indeed examples harmonize with the voice of reason, but not all examples, but those only which are distinguished by their piety, and are proportionately worthy of imitation. For suicide we cannot cite the example of patriarchs, prophets, or apostles, though our Lord Jesus Christ, when he admonished them to flee from city to city if they were persecuted, might very well have taken that occasion to advise them to lay violent hands on themselves, and so escape their persecutors. But seeing he did not do this, nor propose this mode of departing this life, though he were addressing his own friends for whom he had promised to prepare everlasting mansions, it is obvious that such examples as are produced from the nations that forget God give no warrant of imitation to the worshippers of the one true God. CHAPTER Twenty Three. Besides Lucretia, of whom enough has already been said, our advocates of suicide have some difficulty in finding any other prescriptive example, unless it be that of Cato, who killed himself at Utica. His example is appealed to not because he was the only man who did so, but because he was so esteemed as a learned and excellent man, that it could plausibly be maintained that what he did was and is a good thing to do. But of this action of his, what can I say but that his own friends, enlightened men as he, prudently dissuaded him, and therefore judged his act to be that of a feeble, rather than a strong spirit, and dictated not by honourable feeling forestalling shame, but by weakness shrinking from hardships? Indeed, Cato condemns himself by the advice he gave to his dearly loved son. For if it was a disgrace to live under Caesar's rule, why did the father urge the son to this disgrace, by encouraging him to trust absolutely to Caesar's generosity? Why did he not persuade him to die along with himself? If Torquatus was applauded for putting his son to death, when contrary to orders he had engaged, and engaged successfully, with the enemy, why did conquered Cato spare his conquered son, though he did not spare himself? Was it more disgraceful to be a victor contrary to orders, than to submit to a victor contrary to the received ideas of honour? Cato, then, cannot have deemed it to be shameful to live under Caesar's rule, for had he done so, the father's sword would have delivered his son from this disgrace. The truth is that his son, whom he both hoped and desired would be spared by Caesar, was not more loved by him than Caesar was envied the glory of pardoning him, as indeed Caesar himself is reported to have said, or if envy is too strong a word, let us say he was ashamed that this glory should be his. CHAPTER Twenty Four. Our opponents are offended at our preferring to Cato the saintly Job, who endured dreadful evils in his body rather than deliver himself from all torment by self-inflicted death. 
or other saints of whom it is recorded in our authoritative and trustworthy books that they bore captivity and the oppression of their enemies rather than commit suicide but their own books authorize us to prefer to marcus cato marcus regulus for cato had never conquered caesar and when conquered by him disdained to submit himself to him and that he might escape this submission put himself to death Regulus, on the contrary, had formerly conquered the Carthaginians, and in command of the army of Rome had won for the Roman Republic a victory which no citizen could bewail, and which the enemy himself was constrained to admire. Yet afterwards, when he in his turn was defeated by them, he preferred to be their captive rather than to put himself beyond their reach by suicide. Patient under the domination of the Carthaginians, and constant in his love of the Romans, he neither deprived the one of his conquered body, nor the other of his unconquered spirit. Neither was it love of life that prevented him from killing himself. This was plainly enough indicated by his unhesitatingly returning, on account of his promise and oath, to the same enemies whom he had more grievously provoked by his words in the Senate than even by his arms in battle. Having such a contempt of life, and preferring to end it by whatever torments excited enemies might contrive, rather than terminate it by his own hand, he could not more distinctly have declared how great a crime he judged suicide to be. Among all their famous and remarkable citizens, the Romans have no better man to boast of than this, who was neither corrupted by prosperity, for he remained a very poor man after winning such victories, nor broken by adversity, for he returned intrepidly to the most miserable end. But if the bravest and most renowned heroes, who had but an earthly country to defend, and who, though they had but false gods, yet rendered them a true worship, and carefully kept their oath to them, if these men, who by the custom and right of war put conquered enemies to the sword, yet shrank from putting an end to their own lives even when conquered by their enemies, if, though they had no fear at all of death, they would yet rather suffer slavery than commit suicide, how much rather must Christians, the worshippers of the true God, the aspirants to a heavenly citizenship, shrink from this act, if in God's providence they have been for a season delivered into the hands of their enemies to prove or to correct them? And certainly Christians subjected to this humiliating condition will not be deserted by the Most High, who for their sakes humbled himself. Neither should they forget that they are bound by no laws of war, nor military orders, to put even a conquered enemy to the sword. And if a man may not put to death the enemy who has sinned, or may yet sin against him, who is so infatuated as to maintain that he may kill himself, because an enemy has sinned, or is going to sin, against him? Chapter 25 but, we are told, there is ground to fear that when the body is subjected to the enemy's lust, the insidious pleasure of sense may entice the soul to consent to the sin, and steps must be taken to prevent so disastrous a result. And is not suicide the proper mode of preventing not only the enemy's sin, but the sin of the Christian so allured? Now, in the first place, the soul which is led by God and his wisdom, rather than by bodily concupiscence, will certainly never consent to the desire aroused in its own flesh by another's lust. And at all events, if it be true, as the truth plainly declares, that suicide is a detestable and damnable wickedness, who is such a fool as to say, Let us sin now, that we may obviate a possible future sin. Let us now commit murder, lest we perhaps afterwards should commit adultery. If we are so controlled by iniquity that innocence is out of the question, and we can at best but make a choice of sins, is not a future and uncertain adultery preferable to a present and certain murder? Is it not better to commit a wickedness which penitence may heal, than a crime which leaves no place for healing contrition? I say this for the sake of those men or women who fear that they may be enticed into consenting to their violator's lust, and think they should lay violent hands on themselves, and so prevent not another's sin, but their own. But far be it from the mind of a Christian confiding in God, and resting in the hope of his aid, far be it, I say, from such a mind to yield a shameful consent to pleasures of the flesh, howsoever presented. And if that lustful disobedience which still dwells in our mortal members follows its own law irrespective of our will, surely its motions in the body of one who rebels against them are as blameless as its motions in the body of one who sleeps. CHAPTER Twenty Six. But, they say, in the time of persecution some holy women escaped those who menaced them with outrage by casting themselves into rivers which they knew would drown them, and having died in this manner they are venerated in the church Catholic as martyrs. Of such persons I do not presume to speak rashly. 
I cannot tell whether there may not have been vouchsafed to the church some divine authority, proved by trustworthy evidences, for so honouring their memory. It may be that it is so. It may be they were not deceived by human judgment, but prompted by divine wisdom to their act of self-destruction. We know that this was the case with Samson. And, when God enjoins any act, and intimates by plain evidence that he has enjoined it, who will call obedience criminal? Who will accuse so religious a submission? But then every man is not justified in sacrificing his son to God, because Abraham was commendable in so doing. The soldier who has slain a man in obedience to the authority under which he is lawfully commissioned is not accused of murder by any law of his state. Nay, if he has not slain him, it is then he is accused of treason to the state, and of despising the law. But if he has been acting on his own authority, and at his own impulse, he has in this case incurred the crime of shedding human blood. And thus he is punished for doing without orders the very thing he is punished for neglecting to do when he has been ordered. If the commands of a general make so great a difference, shall the commands of God make none? He then who knows it is unlawful to kill himself may nevertheless do so if he is ordered by him whose commands we may not neglect. Only let him be very sure that the divine command has been signified. As for us, we can become privy to the secrets of conscience only in so far as these are disclosed to us, and so far only do we judge. No one knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him. But this we affirm, this we maintain, this we every way pronounce to be right, that no man ought to inflict on himself voluntary death, for this is to escape the ills of time by plunging into those of eternity. That no man ought to do so on account of another man's sins, for this were to escape a guilt which could not pollute him by incurring great guilt of his own. That no man ought to do so on account of his own past sins, for he has all the more need of this life that these sins may be healed by repentance. That no man should put an end to this life to obtain that better life we look for after death, for those who die by their own hand have no better life after death. CHAPTER Twenty Seven. There remains one reason for suicide which I mentioned before, and which is thought a sound one, namely to prevent one's falling into sin, either through the blandishments of pleasure or the violence of pain. If this reason were a good one, then we should be impelled to exhort men at once to destroy themselves as soon as they have been washed in the labour of regeneration, and have received the forgiveness of all sin. Then is the time to escape all future sin when all past sin is blotted out. And if this escape be lawfully secured by suicide, why not then specially? Why does any baptized person hold his hand from taking his own life? Why does any person who is freed from the hazards of this life again expose himself to them, when he has power so easily to rid himself of them all, and when it is written, He who loveth danger shall fall into it? Why does he love, or at least face, so many serious dangers, by remaining in this life from which he may legitimately depart? But is any one so blinded and twisted in his moral nature, and so far astray from the truth, as to think that, though a man ought to make away with himself for fear of being led into sin by the oppression of one man, his master, he ought yet to live, and so expose himself to the hourly temptations of this world, both to all those evils which the oppression of one master involves, and to numberless other miseries in which this life inevitably implicates us? What reason, then, is there for our consuming time in those exhortations by which we seek to animate the baptized, either to virginal chastity, or vigil continence, or matrimonial fidelity, when we have so much more simple and compendious a method of deliverance from sin, by persuading those who are fresh from baptism to put an end to their lives, and so pass to their Lord pure and well-conditioned? If any one thinks that such persuasion should be attempted, I say he is not foolish, but mad. With what face, then, can he say to any man, Kill yourself, lest to your small sins you add a heinous sin, while you live under an unchaste master, whose conduct is that of a barbarian? How can he say this, if he cannot without wickedness say, Kill yourself, now that you are washed from all your sins, lest you fall again into similar or even aggravated sins, while you live in a world which has such power to allure by its unclean pleasures, to torment by its horrible cruelties, to overcome by its errors and terrors? It is wicked to say this, it is therefore wicked to kill oneself. For if there could be any just cause of suicide, this were so, and since not even this is so, there is none. CHAPTER Twenty Eight. Let not your life, then, be a burden to you, ye faithful servants of Christ, though your chastity was made the sport of your enemies. 
you have a grand and true consolation if you maintain a good conscience and know that you did not consent to the sins of those who were permitted to commit sinful outrage upon you and if you should ask why this permission was granted indeed it is a deep providence of the creator and governor of the world and unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out nevertheless faithfully interrogate your own souls whether ye have not been unduly puffed up by your integrity and continence and chastity and whether ye have not been so desirous of the human praise that is accorded to these virtues that ye have envied some who possessed them i for my part do not know your hearts and therefore i make no accusation i do not even hear what your hearts answer when you question them and yet if they answer that it is as i have supposed it might be do not marvel that you have lost that by which you can win men's praise and retain that which cannot be exhibited to men if you did not consent to sin it was because god added his aid to his grace that it might not be lost and because shame before men succeeded to human glory that it might not be loved but in both respects even the faint-hearted among you have a consolation approved by the one experience chastened by the other justified by the one corrected by the other as to those whose hearts when interrogated reply that they have never been proud of the virtue of virginity widowhood or matrimonial chastity but condescending to those of low estate rejoice with trembling in these gifts of god and that they have never envied any one the like excellences of sanctity and purity but rose superior to human applause which is wont to be abundant in proportion to the rarity of the virtue applauded and rather desired that their own number be increased than that by the smallness of their numbers each of them should be conspicuous even such faithful women i say must not complain that permission was given to the barbarians so grossly to outrage them nor must they allow themselves to believe that god overlooked their character when he permitted acts which no one with impunity commits for some most flagrant and wicked desires are allowed free play at present by the secret judgment of god and are reserved to the public and final judgment moreover it is possible that those christian women who are unconscious of any undue pride on account of their virtuous chastity whereby they sinlessly suffered the violence of their captors had yet some lurking infirmity which might have betrayed them into a proud and contemptuous bearing had they not been subjected to the humiliation that befell them in the taking of the city as therefore some men were removed by death that no wickedness might change their disposition so these women were outraged lest prosperity should corrupt their modesty neither those women then who were already puffed up by the circumstance that they were still virgins nor those who might have been so puffed up had they not been exposed to the violence of the enemy lost their chastity but rather gained humility the former were saved from pride already cherished the latter from pride that would shortly have grown upon them we must further notice that some of these sufferers may have conceived that continence is a bodily good and abides so long as the body is inviolate and did not understand that the purity both of the body and the soul rests on the steadfastness of the will strengthened by god's grace and cannot be forcibly taken from an unwilling person from this error they are probably now delivered for when they reflect how conscientiously they served god and when they settle again to the firm persuasion that he can in no wise desert those who so serve him and so invoke his aid and when they consider what they cannot doubt how pleasing to him is chastity they are shut up to the conclusion that he could never have permitted these disasters to befall his saints if by them that saintliness could be destroyed which he himself had bestowed upon them and delights to see in them chapter twenty nine the whole family of god most high and most true has therefore a consolation of its own a consolation which cannot deceive and which has in it a surer hope than the tottering and falling affairs of earth can afford they will not refuse the discipline of this temporal life in which they are schooled for life eternal nor will they lament their experience of it for the good things of earth they use as pilgrims who are not detained by them and its ills either prove or improve them and as for those who insult over them in their trials and when ills befall them say where is thy god we may ask them where their gods are when they suffer the very calamities for the sake of avoiding which they worship their gods or maintain they ought to be worshipped for the family of christ is furnished with its reply our god is everywhere present holy everywhere not confined to any place he can be present unperceived and be absent without moving 
when he exposes us to adversities, it is either to prove our perfections, or correct our imperfections, and in return for our patient endurance of the sufferings of time, he reserves for us an everlasting reward. But who are you that we should deign to speak to you about even your own gods, much less about our God, who is to be feared above all gods? For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. CHAPTER Thirty. If the famous Scipio Nasica were now alive, who was once your pontiff, and was unanimously chosen by the Senate, when, in the panic created by the Punic War, they sought for the best citizen to entertain the Phrygian goddess, he would curb this shamelessness of yours, though you would perhaps scarcely dare to look upon the countenance of such a man. For why in your calamities do you complain of Christianity, unless because you desire to enjoy your luxurious license unrestrained, and to lead an abandoned and profligate life, without the interruption of any uneasiness or disaster? For certainly your desire for peace and prosperity and plenty is not prompted by any purpose of using these blessings honestly, that is to say with moderation, sobriety, temperance, and piety. For your purpose rather is to run riot in an endless variety of sottish pleasures, and thus to generate from your prosperity a moral pestilence which will prove a thousandfold more disastrous than the fiercest enemies. It was such a calamity as this that Scipio, your chief pontiff, your best man in the judgment of the whole senate, feared when he refused to agree to the destruction of Carthage, Rome's rival, and opposed Cato, who advised its destruction. He feared security, the enemy of weak minds, and he perceived that a wholesome fear would be a fit guardian for the citizens. And he was not mistaken. The event proved how wisely he had spoken. For when Carthage was destroyed, and the Roman Republic delivered from its great cause of anxiety, a crowd of disastrous evils forthwith resulted from the prosperous condition of things. First Concord was weakened and destroyed by fierce and bloody seditions, then followed by a concatenation of baleful causes, civil wars which brought in their train such massacres, such bloodshed, such lawless and cruel prescription and plunder, that those Romans who, in the days of their virtue, had expected injury only at the hands of their enemies, now that their virtue was lost, suffered greater cruelties at the hands of their fellow-citizens. The lust of rule, which with other vices existed among the Romans, in more unmitigated intensity than among any other people, after it had taken possession of the more powerful few, subdued under its yoke the rest, worn and wearied. CHAPTER Thirty One. For at what stage would that passion rest, when once it has lodged in a proud spirit, until by a succession of advances it has reached even the throne? And to obtain such advances nothing avails but unscrupulous ambition. But unscrupulous ambition has nothing to work upon, save in a nation corrupted by avarice and luxury. Moreover, a people becomes avaricious and luxurious by prosperity, and it was this which that very prudent man Nasica was endeavouring to avoid, when he opposed the destruction of the greatest, strongest, wealthiest city of Rome's enemy. He thought that thus fear would act as a curb on lust, and that lust being curbed would not run riot in luxury, and that luxury being prevented avarice would be at an end, and that these vices being banished, virtue would flourish and increase the great profit of the state, and liberty, the fit companion of virtue, would abide unfettered. For similar reasons, and animated by the same considerate patriotism, that same chief pontiff of yours, I still refer to him who was adjudged Rome's best man, without one dissentient voice, threw cold water on the proposal of the Senate to build a circle of seats round the theatre, and in a very weighty speech warned them against allowing the luxurious manners of Greece to sap the Roman manliness, and persuaded them not to yield to the enervating and emasculating influence of foreign licentiousness. So authoritative and forcible were his words, that the Senate was moved to prohibit the use even of those benches which hitherto had been customarily brought to the theatre for the temporary use of the citizens. How eagerly would such a man as this have banished from Rome the scenic exhibitions themselves, had he dared to oppose the authority of those whom he supposed to be gods! For he did not know that they were malicious devils, or, if he did, he supposed that they should rather be propitiated than despised. For there had not yet been revealed to the Gentiles the heavenly doctrine which should purify their hearts by faith, and transform their natural disposition by humble godliness, and turn them from the service of proud devils to seek the things that are in heaven, or even above the heavens. CHAPTER Thirty Two. 
Know then, ye who are ignorant of this, and ye who feign ignorance, be reminded, while you murmur against him who has freed you from such rulers, that the scenic games, exhibitions of shameless folly and license, were established at Rome not by men's vicious cravings, but by the appointment of your gods. Much more pardonably might you have rendered divine honours to Scipio than to such gods as these. The gods were not so moral as their pontiff. But give me now your attention, if your mind, inebriated by its deep potations of error, can take in any sober truth. The gods enjoin that games be exhibited in their honour to stay a physical pestilence. Their pontiff prohibited the theatre from being constructed to prevent a moral pestilence. If, then, there remains in you sufficient mental enlightenment to prefer the soul to the body, choose whom you will worship. Besides, though the pestilence was stayed, this was not because the voluptuous madness of stage plays had taken possession of a warlike people hitherto accustomed only to the games of the circus, but these astute and wicked spirits, foreseeing that in due course the pestilence would shortly cease, took occasion to infect not the bodies, but the morals of their worshippers, with a far more serious disease. And in this pestilence these gods find great enjoyment, because it benighted the minds of men with so gross a darkness, and dishonoured them with so foul a deformity, that even quite recently, will posterity be able to credit it, some of those who fled from the sack of Rome and found refuge in Carthage were so infected with this disease, that day after day they seemed to contend with one another who should most madly run after the actors in the theatres. CHAPTER Thirty Three. O oh, infatuated man, what is this blindness, or rather madness, which possesses you? How is it that while, as we hear, even the eastern nations are bewailing your ruin, and while powerful states in the most remote parts of the earth are mourning your fall as a public calamity, ye yourselves should be crowding to the theatres, should be pouring into them and filling them, and in short be playing a madder part now than ever before? This was the foul plague-spot, this the wreck of virtue and honour that Scipio sought to preserve you from, when he prohibited the construction of theatres. This was his reason for desiring that you might still have an enemy to fear, seeing as he did how easily prosperity would corrupt and destroy you. He did not consider that republic flourishing whose walls stand, but whose morals are in ruins. But the seductions of evil-minded devils had more influence with you than the precautions of prudent men. Hence the injuries you do you will not permit to be imputed to you, but the injuries you suffer you impute to Christianity. Depraved by good fortune, and not chastened by adversity, what you desire in the restoration of a peaceful and secure state is not the tranquillity of the commonwealth, but the impunity of your own vicious luxury. Scipio wished you to be hard pressed by an enemy, that you might not abandon yourselves to luxurious manners. But so abandoned are you, that not even when crushed by the enemy is your luxury repressed. You have missed the profit of your calamity, you have been made most wretched, and have remained most profligate. CHAPTER Thirty Four, And that you are yet alive is due to God, who spares you, that you may be admonished to repent and reform your lives. It is he who has permitted you, ungrateful as you are, to escape the sword of the enemy, by calling yourselves his servants, or by finding asylum in the sacred places of the martyrs. It is said that Romulus and Remus, in order to increase the population of the city they founded, opened a sanctuary in which every man might find asylum and absolution of all crime a remarkable foreshadowing of what has recently occurred in honour of Christ. The destroyers of Rome followed the example of its founders. But it was not greatly to their credit that the latter, for the sake of increasing the number of their citizens, did that which the former have done, lest the number of their enemies should be diminished. CHAPTER Thirty Five. Let these and similar answers, if any fuller and fitter answers can be found, be given to their enemies by the redeemed family of the Lord Christ, and by the pilgrim city of King Christ. But let this city bear in mind that among her enemies lie hid those who are destined to be fellow-citizens, that she may not think it a fruitless labor to bear what they inflict as enemies, until they become confessors of the faith. So, too, as long as she is a stranger in the world, the city of God has in her communion, and bound to her by the sacraments, some who shall not eternally dwell in the lot of the saints. Of these, some are not now recognized. Others declare themselves, and do not hesitate to make common cause with our enemies in murmuring against God, whose sacramental badge they wear. These men you may to-day see thronging the churches with us, to-morrow crowding the theatres with the godless.' 
But we have the less reason to despair of the reclamation even of such persons, if among our most declared enemies there are now some, unknown to themselves, who are destined to become our friends. In truth, these two cities are entangled together in this world, and intermixed until the last judgment effects their separation. I now proceed to speak, as God shall help me, of the rise, progress, and end of these two cities. And what I write, I write for the glory of the city of God, that being placed in comparison with the other, it may shine with a brighter luster. CHAPTER Thirty Six. But I have still some things to say in confutation of those who refer the disasters of the Roman Republic to our religion, because it prohibits the offering of sacrifices to the gods. For this end I must recount all, or as many as may seem sufficient, of the disasters which befell that city and its subject provinces before these sacrifices were prohibited. For all these disasters they would doubtless have attributed to us, if at that time our religion had shed its light upon them, and had prohibited their sacrifices. I must then go on to show what social well-being the true God, in whose hand are all kingdoms, vouchsafed to grant to them that their empire might increase. I must show why he did so, and how their false gods, instead of at all aiding them, greatly injured them by guile and deceit. And, lastly, I must meet those who, when on this point convinced and confuted by irrefragable proofs, endeavour to maintain that they worship the gods, not hoping for the present advantages of this life, but for those which are to be enjoyed after death. And this, if I am not mistaken, will be the most difficult part of my task, and will be worthy of the loftiest argument. For we must then enter the lists with the philosophers, not the mere common herd of philosophers, but the most renowned, who in many points agree with ourselves as regarding the immortality of the soul, and that the true God created the world, and by his providence rules all he has created. But as they differ from us on other points, we must not shrink from the task of exposing their errors, that, having refuted the gainsaying of the wicked with such ability as God may vouchsafe, we may assert the city of God, and true piety, and the worship of God, to which alone the promise of true and everlasting felicity is attached. Here, then, let us conclude that we may enter on these subjects in a fresh book. End of Book One, Chapters Sixteen through Thirty Six. Recording by Darren L. Slider, Fort Worth, Texas, www.logoslibrary.org.